Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Passionpreneur Series. So excited that you're back with us. We have another amazing expert for you today. I've been super excited, and actually, I think I've said it a lot this past week, but really excited about today's interview. We have Rachel Richards on board, and she is the author of not one, but two really great financial books. And you know, honestly, the thing I love about Rachel is the fact that she makes it accessible and digestible for us who math is not our forte. I can count money, <laughs> now, whether or not I'm actually doing what should be done with it is a whole different story. So I'm really excited to have you on the show, Rachel, to share with us your tips, your resources, like what are we supposed to be doing as entrepreneurs with our money and our business and in our personal lives to set ourselves up so that we're not just working ourselves to death for the next 30, 40, 50, 60, however long years. And even for those people who a part of our, our, our audience hasn't fully jumped into entrepreneurship, they might still have a nine to five job. What are some things they can do to slowly wing themselves away from that? One of the, the number one things that caught my eye when it came to your bio was the fact that you retired yourself at 27 years old. Like, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Brandy. You're so, thank you for all the kind words. I'm so excited to be here. Of course. So I'm gonna let you take it away, but I would love for you to just give us some backstory into who you are, where all this came from, and then let's definitely dive into this passive income and how do we get some of that? <laughs> okay, for sure. <laughs> it is an exciting topic. Um, so in terms of just a little bit about who I am, I am a lot of things. Um, I'm a former financial advisor. I am, as you said, the best-selling author of two books on financial literacy. I'm a real estate investor. So my husband and I own over 35 rental units in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a professional speaker. And as you said, what people probably find the most intriguing about me is that last year at age 20, I quit my job and retired and I'm now living off over $10,000 per month in passive income. So my life has taken a complete 180 um, just within the last year and it's been a lot of fun. Um, my passive income comes from two main sources right now. Actually, I guess three. Um, I have rent the rental income. So the rental properties make up a big chunk of it. Although, you know, right now we're in the spring of 2020. Um, times are hard, you know, tenants are not exactly able to pay rent. We're working with people on a case by case basis. And I say that to be totally upfront and transparent because one of the great things about having multiple income sources and having this sort of diversified income is that if one income source is impacted in some way or taken away, then you still have all these other income sources keeping you afloat. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so important to sort of plan that way as you become financially independent and work towards this, making sure you do focus on income diversification. Um, so yeah, so rental income is one of our big sources. And then my other big source right now is the passive book royalty income for my two books. So actually in February, I just had my first $7,000 month in book sales which was a really Amazing. awesome thank yeah. you I was very excited to hit that milestone um, and then I actually just launched it's so even we we're just talking about it because it's so brand new but I technically have another passive income source now I just launched my first ever online money management course and it goes along with money honey my first book and so that is you know a, a course where it's pre-recorded videos um, I'm not it's not redundant to the book but I'm teaching about implementation and going further into some of the topics and that'll be something that I release four times a year and that will be an additional um, source of passive income for me so those are just some of the ideas some of the things we do and that's a little bit about me that's amazing I had no idea it was that extensive thank you and I love the idea of the online course I mean those those are, have been really popular for a while now but even more so people are really finding how valuable taking an online course a chunk of just what you need like in, in, instead of signing up for a whole semester at a college or university or community college, like how impactful an online course can be and you can really learn what you need to. 
Mm -hmm. And it's so fun for me too, just selfishly, because, you know, this is a way that I can really influence and help people on a more direct basis. And so I had 50 signups for the beta launch of the course, which is now kind of in, it's going. And it's so fun because I have this group and I get to get, I get to know these 50 readers on a much deeper level and really be hands-on and help them at a much higher level than I ever could before. So it's kind of a (laughs) win-win. That's so cool. Sweet. And you said it's going to be four times a year? Yeah, I think so. It's about, it's going to be about eight, eight or nine weeks long. So I'll just kind of reopen it once, once a quarter, something like that. Perfect. All right. I'm making a note of that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as I mentioned, a lot of our audience are entrepreneurs one to two years into their business, or they might still have a nine to five job and be kind of dipping their toe into having their own business as well. What are some of the things you might share with an, uh, a business owner as far as getting them set themselves set up properly financially? Yeah. Um, Brandy, I'm so glad you asked this because I think there's this, this piece of advice that's given a lot that I totally disagree with. Um, I really hate when people say, just quit your job and take a leap of faith and the net will appear, <laughs> right? Um, I, th- I personally just think that that is irresponsible advice. And I think there's a much better way to go about quitting your job and becoming an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't quit my job until last year. And at that time, like I launched my first book, Money Honey, in 2017, which was several years ago. Um, I started investing in real estate that year. We were, even without property managers, we were managing our properties full time around our jobs. I was writing one book. I was then writing another book. So this was all done, you know, between me and my husband around two full time jobs. We did all of this work in the evenings and on the weekends because basically my goal was okay, well, once I fully replace my full time income, I'll quit my job. And that's initially what we wanted to do. Um, And then we actually took it a step further and we wanted to have at least $10,000 per month in passive income before I quit my job. Mm -hmm. Because not only do we want to have enough money to cover all of our living expenses, but we still wanted to have an even bigger buffer beyond that so that we can continue to save. Or if something unexpected came up, we would be able to cash flow that just fine. So I even want to went beyond just replacing my full-time income. And I decided, okay, I'm not going to quit until I get to this point. Now you don't have to be as conservative or as extreme as me, but I do think it's important to make sure you do have a established and solid basis of creating income from your side hustle or your business or whatever it is before you quit your job, whether that's a thousand dollars a month, 2000 a month, you know, whatever it may be, make sure you have that defined for yourself and you set that as a goal for yourself and really just start thinking about your exit strategy. I mean, come up with a plan to eventually move away from your job and into being an entrepreneur. Um, but don't just do it. And, you know, on the faith that your, your net will appear <laughs> and save you, right. you know, be responsible, be smart about it. The last thing you want to do is quit your job and wow, I'm not making as much income as I thought. And then you have to go back and find another job. You know, um, I think it's just easier to plan a plan for it proactively and in the right way. I love that. So I love how you, when you were telling us your story, how you mentioned how, how valuable it is to have more than one stream of income coming in. Whereas if one as like your real estate right now might be a little shaky, you still have other resources for someone who's just starting their business and all they can think about is let me just get this off the ground. (laughs) What are some things they could do to, to maybe subsidize what they're doing or, or just another way of looking at, you know, passive income or another revenue stream? Yeah, absolutely. So if we're just kind of talking about, well, what are some ways I can increase my income or start creating additional income streams? The first thing to consider is, you know, there's two big categories of income, at least in my definition. This is not like a tax or IRS definition, but I kind of lump everything either into active income or passive income. So active income is what we all typically do. It's if we work a nine to five, we're trading our time for our money. You typically have to be working at a job or on site or trading your hours in return for a pay. So that's active income. Then you have passive income, which we've already talked about a little bit. Um, And passive income is money that is earned with little to no ongoing work. So it sounds almost too good to be true, but I promise that it is, it's no get rich quick scheme. It's really not anything like that. 
passive income does take time or money to create. So there is a little bit of a curve, you know, a little bit of a time investment to get this up and running. Then once you have this passive income stream built, then it becomes a lot more hands off and that's when it really becomes passive. So the first thing to decide is, well, do I want to generate active income or passive income as I'm looking to build out these additional income streams? A lot of people might say passive income, but again, you have to keep in mind, it could take a little bit of time to get that going. Active income is actually a lot easier to start generating right away. So, you know, for someone that's employed full time and looking to have another income stream, they could look at um, asking for a raise or going for a promotion. Now, if that's not available, they can get a part time or temporary job. You know, they can house it, pet sit, dog sit. They can mow lawns or, or shovel snow on weekends. Um, they can do pizza delivery. They can be an Uber or Lyft driver. Mm -hmm. Those are all different ways to make active income. And you can literally start doing any one of those tomorrow. And then passive in the income, on the other hand, the first step there is to ask yourself, okay, well, do I have more time or do I have more money to put towards this passive income stream? And if you're like me, when I first asked myself that question, I was like, I have neither. <laughs> so then you can ask yourself, well, which one is going to be easier to create? Is it going to be easier for you to free up more time or is it going to be easier for you to create more money? Because you will need one or the other to create this passive income stream. So that's really where you start with that. Um, in my newest book, Passive Income, Aggressive Retirement, I talk about 28 different passive income models. So trust me, there is plenty of ideas out there. Anyone can create passive income. I truly, truly believe that. 28 different models? Yes. Oh yes, that's goodness. correct. Yeah, way more than I ever thought. And I only do you know, three of them. So you don't, have to be, you don't have to be an expert at every one of these. You just need to find one that works. Oh my goodness. Okay, can you just give us two other ones aside from the ones you've already shared? Yes, yes. Okay, here's one that I'm so intrigued by. And if I had like more time or if I needed more money, I would do this. Um, vending machines. So I kind of categorize it in the book. This falls under the coin operated income category. So vending machines, if you can find a location, invest in a couple vending machines, set them up. And then all you have to do once a week is go around and collect money and restock. And you can even outsource that. So that's how you make it really passive. Oh my and it, it could take, you know, five or 10 vending machines to make significant income, but you know, you're not always going to make five grand a month from a passive income stream. Maybe you make 500 bucks a month from 10 passive income streams. Right. So okay. anyways, I love that one vending machines. Um, Another really big category is portfolio income. So this is a pretty commonly known one. This is, you know, investing and earning money off dividends or interest or whatever it may be. Now, the, the thing with portfolio income is that you generally need to have a lot of money up front to generate any meaningful income off of that. Mm -hmm. So this isn't something that I think is like attainable for most people. I, I certainly am not generating any meaningful portfolio income at some point, but this is something that once I have enough passive income created elsewhere, maybe I'll start sort of transitioning that into some portfolio income. Um, and then I'll give a third idea just as a bonus. Yeah. Um, another big category is rental income. You know, a lot of people think they can't get into rental property investing because it costs money, but there are ways around that. But something that anybody can do, whether you rent or you own um, your own house, is if you have extra storage space, whether it's an extra bedroom or closet or garage, there's actually a website called Neighbor, and you can rent out that space for storage space for other people. So when people are looking, you know, for storage facilities or storage units, they can get on Neighbor and be like, oh, well, who in my neighborhood, you know, I can keep my stuff at their place and pay a lot less money. And then on the other side, you're making this passive income each month. So I think that's brilliant and really easy for anybody to do. That's genius. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cause I was going to, well, I was going to ask you regarding the rental. Does that also include Airbnb or is that strictly for full-time rentals, leasing, that sort of thing? Yeah. So you can do either one. So Airbnb is more of a short-term rental and some people would argue that it's not passive. When I say passive, you know, I'm basically comparing to a full-time job. So if you're able to sustain a passive income stream with just a couple hours a week or a few hours a month, like to me, that's super passive. That's a lot better than a 40 hour a week job. Right. Um, now some people disagree and they think, Oh, well, an Airbnb is not passive because I'm still having to manage it or a rental property is not passive. I do agree to a point, and I think that you need to have a property manager in place up front 
to really make it passive because after all, none of us want to quit our jobs to become a full-time landlord, right? right. Um, so make sure you deal, build in that expense. Um, but yes, I do think an Airbnb is another great source of passive income. Kind of the trade-off is, okay, with an Airbnb, it is going to be more work. You're going to have to do more cleaning, more turnover between people, a little bit more hands-on management, um, but you're going to make more money that way as well. Whereas with a normal long-term traditional um, rental property, you know, long-term tenant, it's a little bit more hands-off, but you'll probably make a little bit less money. So it's kind of the trade-off between time versus money. Okay. Now I'm just curious, you mentioned that your rental properties are in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Was that on purpose or did you live there at one time? Yes, I did. So actually this, we are in the middle of a cross country move right now, which is crazy timing, right? <laughs> So my husband and I, I lived in Louisville, Kentucky for 20 years. So it's really my hometown. It's where I kind of consider, I grew my, I grew up in Kentucky really. Um, so we invested there because we lived there and because it's a really great place to invest. Anywhere in the Midwest is fantastic. The housing prices are low. It's a low cost of living. Generally, I think that's a great place to invest. Um, but I do encourage people, don't be afraid to become a long distance landlord. You know, if you live in the Bay Area or in New York City, I get it. It is a lot harder to invest in rental properties out there. And yes. believe me, if I lived there I and, and tried to invest there, I just wouldn't be where I am today. So, you know, if that's you, if you're in one of those areas, then don't be afraid to kind of look outside of your area. Um, I know somebody who lives in Arizona who just invested in Wisconsin because they know people there. Maybe she grew up there, something like that. But she has this awesome Airbnb now that's making like tons of money every month. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm actually walking the walk, right? Because I am a long distance landlord. So we're managing everything from afar. We have people in place to help us out. Um, it's definitely doable. So I'm assuming that when it comes to rentals, rental properties, that is more of a, a long game you're playing because you're finding the prop, you're getting your money together, you're finding the properties, maybe having to fix them up in some cases, and then finding the tenants to occupy. Yeah, it could be. And I, I kind of look at passive income as having two stages. So stage one is getting the passive income into place. It's creating it, it's building it, it's spending that time or that money creating the passive income stream. So with a rental property, stage one starts with, you know, looking for a house to getting that down payment together, to finding a house, to closing on it, to maybe fixing it up, and then finally to renting it out. And then stage two is once you run it out and you have it going, then that's when it becomes passive. So that stage one can be short or long, depending on the passive income stream. Um, when I think back to our first rental property, we began looking for one in 2016. And we had money saved um, that we could invest. And I think it took us about nine months to actually find one that worked out because we made several offers, things fell through. We looked at so many different houses. So I believe it took us about nine months to find one and get a contract on one, basically. Um, it is something where patience pays off. You don't ever want to rush into a deal. You don't ever want to go into a deal hoping that the numbers are going to work out. You really want to do your homework. You want to feel really confident in it from the very get-go. And that can take time because you don't want to just you know, make an offer on the first deal you come across. You really want it to be the right deal. But again, patience pays off. But yes, it could take, you know, several months, even a year to kind of get that rental property income passive stream going. And how long after or how soon after your first property did you invest in your second? Well, we closed on our duplex in January 2017 and we closed on our next property in I want to say November or September. So it was maybe another nine or so months okay. from that first one. But then once you start doing that, like we were taking all of the cash flow and saving it up to reinvest. So that first duplex we bought was immediately cash flowing 500 bucks per month in pure profit, which was also like our best real estate deal that we'll ever do. I mean, it was such a good investment. Um, so we were taking that money and saving it up. And then of course, once we got the next property, we had this other passive income stream coming in. So it, it's very easy to build up momentum. And once you have a couple under your belt, you can acquire properties really quickly. I actually, it's funny to think back because my initial goal with real estate investing, and this was before I even met my husband, but I was going to buy 15 
one single family property per year for 15 years, all on 15 year mortgages. And this is kind of a common um, strategy that people use, but I figured, okay, this means that in 15 years, I'll be retired and I'll be in my mid thirties by then basically. So mm -hmm. that was my initial goal. And it's just so funny to think about how quickly we were able to get there because we only started investing in real estate three years ago and now we're already where we are. So it can actually right. go a lot faster than you think. That's phenomenal. And again, when you retired in 27, that was strictly off of the real estate income that was coming in. And the royalty income and from my books. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, at that point when I retired, we were making over $10,000 per month. Um, our real estate income these days, you know, except for what's going on right now, normally makes between seven to 12 grand in a given month. And then as I, I think I said that my book royalties, my, I just had my first $7,000 month. So we're, we're really more closer to 15 grand a month at this point. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so now this might be obvious, but if you're having to get a loan in order to get your first property, are you doing it wrong? Or is that still in alignment Oh yeah, I think that's, I love that you asked that question. So uh, we have mortgages on all of our properties. Um, I think that if we had tried to buy all of our properties in cash, you know, there's reasons to do that, but it definitely slows down your progress because who has, you know, 200 grand lying around in cash at age 24, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, we went into it getting mortgages on all of our properties. Um, there is a safe way to do that in terms of making sure you're not being over leveraged. And these days, lenders normally do require you to put 20 to 25% down as a down payment on an investment property. So normally that is a requirement. Now there are ways to get around that and there are ways to invest in real estate with having less money um, that I can certainly speak to, but just to make sure that you're not over leveraged. And when I say over leveraged, that means if you're putting a three or 5% down payment on a house, that means that you're borrowing 95 to 97% of the, of, of the house basically as a loan to pay for the house. And in times like right now or in 2008, when the economy is in a rough condition or maybe the real estate market's gonna go down, that's when people end up underwater on their loan. Meaning that the value of the house goes down, let's say by 10%, which means that the, your loan is actually more than the house is worth. Right. That's where you get into serious trouble. So I always recommend you putting down at least 20% down on an investment property. That way you have that 80% equity and that's a lot safer. Some people even recommend 70, 30, you put a 30% payment down and then you have 70% in equity, but you know, that way you can be safe about it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a mortgage out to get into real estate investing. It can speed up the process. Being leveraged can be an absolute great thing. You just have to make sure you're doing it the right way and you're being safe about it. Wow. This is so valuable. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad. So I want to shift gears a little bit because we're getting really real estate heavy, which I could talk about all day. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm actually in that, that realm right now where I'm looking to start investing in real estate. So this is right up my alley. Nice. But for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm curious as to where affiliate marketing comes in or, um, and this might not, this might not be the same category, but multi-level level marketing as well. Mm -hmm. Are those also examples of passive income that you can? Yeah, these, yeah, you're asking the best questions. I'm getting so excited. So thank you for asking good questions. <laughs> yeah. So I would say an MLM is definitely active income okay. because you are either having to sell products directly or recruit people. And mm -hmm. that normally involves like full-time work. You know, you can't earn money really from that without actively putting in the effort and without trading your time. Because if you stop working on the MLM, your income goes away, right? right? So so that's kind of what I think about MLMs. Now, affiliates, affiliate marketing, it depends. I actually do talk about affiliate marketing as one of the passive income streams in my book. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you have to make sure, like this is where I could get in trouble with people who kind of argue with me about this because maybe people don't think it's passive. You have to make sure you set it up the right way from the get-go so that it can be truly passive. Um, so one of the things I did in my book where I didn't have personal experience or expertise expertise myself because I haven't done all 28 passive income models. Um, I interviewed subject matter experts who had done it successfully. 
and I feature them as case studies throughout my book. So I got to talk to Bobby Hoyt, who is the founder of the Millennial Money Man blog and community, and he is awesome. And I featured him as a case study on somebody who has set up affiliate marketing and a blog and advertising in an extremely passive way, very, very successfully. He has like over a million readers per month or something. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, I forget the numbers, they're in my book, but I think he makes like 50 grand a month from his blog. Um, all from ads and all from affiliate marketing. Yes. 50 oh grand a month. <laughs> yeah. So trust me, there are ways you can do this successfully. And I talked to another person too, um, who is not as, you know, well known. Cause I don't want people to think, well, oh yeah, only if you're famous or if you're an influencer, can you do this? There's somebody I talked to that's a lot smaller time that's making, um, I think she was making a thousand dollars when I wrote the book per month. And now she's making closer to $3,000 per month, but she's based in India and she's a lawyer turned blogger. Um, but again, it's just another example of how you can make a passive blog. You know, you need to make sure you structure it correctly so that you're not always having to create new content because then that's active. You mm -hmm. have to be able to outsource it. You have to be able to hire writers to kind of have a team that can continue this ongoing work for you so that you can be a lot more hands off. I love that. I've, I've never heard a, well, a blog monetized that way. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. Like, yeah. You think of a blog and you're like, okay, I need to think of content images, you know, mm -hmm. do the work basically, but that's amazing. Yeah. It's pretty cool. People have found ways to really make it passive. So maybe you've heard regarding Amazon and their affiliate yes. program right now. And so a lot of people that were depending on that are, are hurting or will be hurting because of the commissions levels being cut drastically. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions on how to, to combat that if that is something you're going to be experiencing? It? Yeah, you know, I, I just heard that the other day and that's so rough. So many people make their income that way. Um, I, think, I think Amazon cut their stuff from like 8% on certain things to 1%. Exactly. I mean, that's like... <laughs> what, a 70% cut or something? So that's 70% of your income going away. Right. Um, absolutely crazy. So there's a couple things I would say. Part of it goes back to having that income diversification. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Don't rely on something like affiliate marketing to provide 100% of your income. You never want to be completely dependent on a single source of income. So make sure you always have multiple sources of income. And exactly, just like me with the rental income, you know, if my rental income is slashed by 70% right now, which it is like literally, um, I am fine because I have these other income streams coming in. So that's something to think about going forward. You know, how can I better protect myself? How can I create additional income streams so that if one is hurting, I have other sources of income to keep me afloat. Um, the other thing I would say, you know, in my book, Passive Income Aggressive Retirement, I talk about you know, how can we judge one passive income stream against another? Which one's the best one? Which one's the safest and the most secure? And I talk about these different factors that you can use to sort of judge things. Um, one of the factors is controllability. How much control do you have over it? The thing with Amazon, and this, it's hard to avoid for a lot of these, but it's something to think about. The thing with Amazon or any of these platforms is, can they change it on a whim and you're totally screwed? because that's exactly what happened with Amazon affiliate marketing. Like you don't have control over that. They can do whatever they want and change things whenever they want. And you don't, I mean, there's nothing you can do to stop them. Now I could say I'm in the same position. I have both of my books self-published on Amazon's Kindle direct publishing platform. So same goes for me. I'm putting myself at risk there, but it is something at least to just be aware of and consider as you're building out these passive income streams, having a platform that you control 100% is always better than, you know, something else that you have no control over. Absolutely. Okay. So keeping that in mind, say someone has a product and they want to set up their own maybe affiliate channel so that other people are helping to sell their product. Is that something more in line where they, again, they have more control over it and it may not be totally passive, at least not initially, but that could be a really good idea. Yeah, I think so. And I think there's no harm in doing everything, you know, being an affiliate through Amazon, being an affiliate through all these other different platforms and websites, and also setting up your own website or blog that you do have more control over and, you know, setting up affiliate marketing through that directly. I think, I think the more you can do, the more you can diversify, the better off you are. Absolutely. Okay. 
So I know your book is called Passive Income, Aggressive Retirement. Yes. Talking more now about the retirement side. Being an entrepreneur, small business owner, I mean, you're in charge of that. Like that is all on you. You're in your, the company you work for is not going to be putting anything into your 401k, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that a person just starting out might start to, to get that ball rolling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you asked that because I think there's two ways in my mind now that one can retire. Um, and the traditional way we've gone about retiring is what I refer to as the nest egg theory. Mm -hmm. So this is where you save up a large chunk of money, otherwise known as a nest egg, so that when you're 65, you can live off that money until you pass away. So that's how we've all traditionally thought about retirement. Now that there's a couple problems with this, I think this theory you to work really well. This is kind of what people have always done, but times have changed in several ways, making this actually really difficult, if not impossible, and totally unrealistic to try to achieve. So for example, we have a longer life expectancy now. So that means we're having to fund additional years of retirement. And if every year costs us, you know, 50 or $100,000, that could be multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars more that we need in order to retire. Also, the most alarming thing that I've read recently is that the social, social Security Trust Fund is projected to be fully depleted by the year 2035. Okay, 15 oh years from now. This is literally written on the socialsecurity.gov website. So ah. this is their own report, like their annual report. Yeah, so it's, it's projected to be gone in 15 years. So that means that we can't even count on Social Security to be there to supplement our retirement. Um, another really big change is the, that the cost of college has increased so much in the past decade, and that has put an enormous burden on my generation in terms of student loans, in terms of being able to pay for college and to get an education. So that's become very burdensome. Um, lots of things have changed, but overall, it's made it very, very difficult to, to try to do that whole nest egg theory. And studies have shown, studies have come out recently that, said, that say that millennials will need to accumulate at least $2 million by age 65 in order to retire. Okay, $2 million. That is a lot of money. I don't know about you, but that is daunting to me. You know, how, you know, it's like, how am I going to come up with $2 million? Do I even know a multimillionaire? No. <laughs> so how, so it feels very daunting and intimidating. Um, and not to mention, I think that the gen, the younger generations have changed and they don't want to give up 40 of their prime years of their life working and trading their hours and going to a cubicle every day only to retire at 65. You know, we want to enjoy our life now. We want to travel now and do things that are awesome now while we're young and we're physically healthy and fit. You know, so I just think that so much has changed. And that's why I think passive income is the much more attainable way to achieve early retirement and financial independence. Because when you think about this whole passive income concept, I basically had this epiphany a few years ago that once your passive income exceeds your living expenses, you're retired, right? You're financially independent. Yeah. So the, the goal then just becomes earning, creating enough passive income to cover your living expenses. Now, in my case, I wanted to create more because I want to keep saving money each month because I like to be very conservative and have that buffer. Mm -hmm. But once you do that, you're good. You're set, you're set for life. You know, this whole nest egg theory can kind of go away. So that's why I think passive income, you know, anyone can do it. Anyone at any age on any income can achieve financial independence by creating passive income. And I think it's so important to also reiterate that even though you retired at 27, you're not, you're not done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was just, it, in, a, in a way, it's just a label, but yeah. it, what, it, what it has allowed you to do is to now explore the world, to do whatever else you want to do, to invest, to give, to serve, however you want to. Exactly. And you know, somebody actually was arguing with me the other day. They were like, well, you're not retired. You're still working. And I'm like, well, when I say retired, I mean that I'm financially independent. Right. You know, some people want to retire and golf all day and sit on a beach and that's fine. Like that's beautiful. And that's the whole point is that you can do whatever you want. Um, I just, I get bored very easily, you know? <laughs> so, so the beauty of it right now is that 
I don't have to work anymore. I work right now because it's my true life passion Mm -hmm. and I can now work when, where, and if I want. So it's just being able to have the freedom to do whatever you want to do with your life. Ah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it too. <laughs> Good. That is, that to me, that's the new American dream. Mm-hmm. That is everyone's dream. It is. Yeah. Okay. I know we're running out of time, but I do also want to touch on finances in the terms of as a business owner, being really smart with your money and knowing like what to do with it when it's coming in and knowing that just what, what the bank account says does not necessarily mean what you have to spend. And just some ideas, some tips on how we can better structure our finances so mm-hmm. that we're not overspending in our business. Um, we're paying our taxes. You know, a, a lot of people um, or a lot of experts that I follow, you know, some will recommend the envelope theory or system, you know, the bucket system where you're putting aside the money you receive in 30% here, 20% Mm -hmm. there. Um, are, Are there any, is there a particular system that you follow or you recommend? I do. I have my own system. So I will, I will teach you about my savings bucket system. And there's a couple of concepts I talk about in Money Honey that really resonate with people. And if nothing else, the savings buckets, I get an email about them every day from a reader saying that they've changed their lives. So this has resonated with people in such a crazy way. Um, you know, I used to think that the concept of savings was super confusing because I was always saving for different things. I was saving for even just to go out on the weekend or to buy a flight home for Christmas to be with my family or to save money for Christmas gifts in the next six months, Mm -hmm. or I was saving for retirement. So there's all these different things you're saving for. So it can be very confusing trying to figure out when you have this money coming in, what do you do with it? You know, do I save, do I pay off debt? So when we're talking about savings specifically, I think it's a lot easier to think about savings in terms of timelines. So dividing up your savings into different buckets. So I talk about four buckets. Bucket number one is for emergency savings. And you should always have at least $1,000 set aside in bucket number one. And that's because none of us can predict the future, right? So we don't know when our car is going to break down or when our dog is going to eat another tennis ball. Literally, that's happened to me before. (laughs) Yeah, so we have to be able to pay for that unexpected expense because if we don't have that there, then guess what's going to happen? We're going to go into credit card debt. So this is the first step in securing yourself financially. Bucket number one for emergency savings with at least a thousand bucks. Then you have bucket number two. This is for medium term savings. So anything you're saving for within the next 12 months, this could be a trip. This could be, like I said, Christmas gifts that you're saving for. Mm -hmm. If you're a student, maybe this is a tuition payment or books for your next semester. Mm -hmm. So anything you're saving up for within the next 12 months. Then you have your long-term bucket. This is bucket three for things that you're saving for that are more than a year away, but before retirement. So this normally includes your bigger ticket items like a wedding or an engagement ring or a down payment on a house or your kid's college education, any of those things. And then finally you have bucket number four, which is for retirement. So this is where you'd have your 401k and your IRA and everything you're saving for to retire. If you're going about retirement, the traditional nest egg way. So I, I always say, you know, make sure you're always contributing to bucket number four because we don't, we don't really know how much we're going to need for retirement, but chances are it's a lot more than we think, especially if we're thinking about that $2 million. So you should always be contributing at least a little bit to bucket number four, but otherwise you'll fill up the buckets consecutively. So you'll fill up bucket number one, then bucket number two, and then bucket number three. So that's kind of the savings buckets concept from Money Honey. Once I started doing things that way, it just became a lot more clear and easy. And I finally kind of knew what to do with my money that was coming in. Because what I don't like is when finance gurus say, oh, save 10% of your paycheck or save 15% of your paycheck. It's like, hey, I need a little more detail. What do I do with this money? (laughs) So that's the savings buckets. Right. I love that. Okay. But then within these four buckets, how much how much do you determine what to put aside? Especially yeah. for retirement. 
Yeah, so the retirement is always tricky. And I, I really try to avoid like telling people a certain number that they need because everyone's situations are different. Um, and that's not a cop out. It's just that like, I can't predict the future any better than anybody else. Right. Um, the best number that I have is that $2 million number, which studies have shown is what millennials need in order to retire at age 65. That's just a ballpark. I mean, that could be way more or way less for anybody. Um, and then in terms of bucket one, you'd have $1,000. Bucket two, and three, I just recommend thinking about what are the things you're saving for within the next year and how much are those things going to cost and what are the things you're saving for that are more than a year away and just trying to estimate those to come up with how much you want in each bucket. Um, the other thing I'll say for bucket two, this is the one that's for medium term savings, so things you're saving for within the next year, you want to make sure you also have at least three to six months worth of living expenses set aside in bucket number two, because that is, again, another way to protect yourself against loss of income or against losing your job is making sure you always have at least three to six months worth of expense, living expenses saved. Which with the current climate would have really come in handy for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. And you know, there's, I think the best thing we can do with what's going on right now is just some inner reflection, you know, just asking ourselves, Hey, Am I happy with the way I was prepared for this or wasn't prepared for this? You know, this is how much I had in my emergency fund. Do I feel good about that? If, you know, if I could go back and do things over again, would I be trying to save more in preparation for this? Mm -hmm. So really coming out of this and thinking, what am I going to do now going forward to be better prepared the next time this happens? Because Mm -hmm. it will happen again. You know, the stock market goes up and down on average, you know, every 10 years. So it will happen again and making sure you really learn from this and grow from this and better prepare for the next time, I think is the best thing that you can do. Wow. Rachel. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. I think that's a great spot to, to finish this on. That was just, I mean, all of this has just been so informative. Thank you so so much. Yes. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you for asking awesome questions. This was so fun. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's not often I get to sit in front of a financial guru. <laughs> guru. So I want to take full advantage. Um, are there any last words of wisdom or anything you want to leave us with? Um, sure. I'll just say one more thing, which is that I'm not perfect. I'm not the most impressive person. Um, I stumbled and fell and failed just as much as anybody else. You know, I struggled with anxiety. I struggled with depression throughout my journey. I struggled with property managers stealing money from me. You know, I have overcome a lot. So I don't want anyone to like look at me and think, well, gosh, this has been so easy for her. You know, she has everything together. She knows what she's doing because I didn't. I didn't know what I was doing half of the time. I struggled just as much as everybody, but I just kept going and, you know, no one's going to be perfect. And I think it's just continuing to try to grow and, and just be a little bit better each day is, is all that we can do. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brandy. This was fun. <laughs> okay. How can we stay in touch with you? Yeah, so both of my books are on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback. Um, and if you love funny money memes, which I do, then you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook. You just search Money Honey Rachel. Um, and my website is moneyhoneyrachel.com. I love it. Thank you so much again for your time, your wisdom, your knowledge. I definitely want to stay connected to you. Me too. And for you guys out there, all of this and more will be in the email that follows this interview. So you'll have access to Rachel for her on her social media platforms, her website, and direct access to purchase her book and to learn more. So do not waste an opportunity. (laughs) Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate this. You guys, thank you for listening and following the Passionpreneur series. And I look forward to connecting with you tomorrow and bringing you more good, good stuff. Have a great rest of your day. Be safe. Be well. Thank you. You too, Brandy. Thank you. Thanks, you guys.